Today, I want to talk to all of the friends and family members out there who are going crazy trying to get somebody they know out of a toxic relationship. I've been on both sides of this situation, so I know that from where you're probably standing, you just don't get it. You don't understand why they won't leave, why they recognize that this person is bad for them, but they just won't up and go. I have been on both sides of this, so I really get what it feels like when you want to see somebody leave a bad situation and they just won't. But as somebody who has also been the one trying to be saved and shooing the lifeboat away, I have some insight that might help you understand it a little bit more, and I hope that that helps. For those of you who are new here, my name is McGann. I am not a doctor. I'm not giving you medical advice. I am just somebody who has spent my whole life around narcissists. So I'm kind of like the narcissist whisperer. So I know the terminology. I recognize their tricks, but all the same, it is really hard to break away. Simply put, when somebody is in a toxic relationship with a narcissist or somebody who is otherwise bad for them, that person might be absolutely oblivious to it, but even when they start to wake up, they won't leave and it doesn't make sense to anybody. And that's because they have been trauma bonded, which I've already done a video covering the different stages of trauma bonding and some different examples of that. So I won't get into super details about it, but basically trauma Trauma bonding puts a person at such extreme emotional highs and lows that they don't know which way is up anymore. Trauma bonding includes gaslighting somebody until their entire version of reality is warped. And the gaslighter might convince them that, oh, your family is bad for you, they don't want us together, or I really love you, even though he's seen like 50 other people. And having that in your head over and over and over again really starts to make you doubt yourself and believe the reality that the gaslighter is painting. And after you go through enough trauma bonding, you end up being emotionally addicted to the person who is traumatizing you. It's kind of like a Stockholm syndrome because you can see that, yeah, this person has emotionally kidnapped me, but the victim is also sitting there going, but you know, he had such a traumatic childhood, so it's not really his fault how he's dealing with me and I want to be empathetic and understanding to him and he really loves me or he's really busy. And you would think as the person trying to save the victim that you just slap them across the face and they snap to to reality, right? Well, no, because an emotional addiction has withdrawal. So if you aren't getting text messages or calls or your reassurance button slapped over and over and over again by your narcissist, then you, the victim, the trauma bonded person who is now emotionally addicted to them starts acting like an addict. You start twitching and tweaking and man, what do I have to do to get his attention back? Uh, what, if, what if I text him? What if I call him? What if I do this? What if I do that? Like what backflip do I have to do to get this person to look at me again? And I will tell you personally, it has been a week since I have had no contact with the last narcissist in my life. And the entire time I have been twitchy, tweaky. Am I blocked on Messenger? I wonder if he'll message me. Just, I I cannot stop obsessing over when and if he'll contact me again. And oh, what will I say if he does? And I know it's unhealthy, but I cannot turn that part of my brain off. It's something that takes time and distance. And a lot of narcissists are able to achieve such a really high level of attachment with people very quickly because they use something called intermittent reinforcement. And that is a technique used for training dogs. It's the lottery system for dogs where every time they sit, you give them a treat. And then after a while, it's randomly. So that way the dog is always sitting when you want it to sit, but you don't always have to give it a treat. And it's pretty much the same in people. When you are getting attention from somebody nonstop and you you know, every time you look at them, you get a treat and then it starts to get taken away. Pretty soon you, the victim, are doing dances and rollovers and sits and bags and stays hoping to get another treat from the narcissist, which is usually, you know, a breadcrumb of attention. And unfortunately, falling for a narcissist is such an abusive process for the victim that it ends up activating the same centers in their brain as a gambling addiction. So the victim starts ignoring all of their personal needs, you know, oh, I need to work. I need to go to school and pay attention in my class. I need to take care of my kids. Suddenly they can't focus on any of that. All they can do is focus on putting these emotional coins into a slot machine and pulling a lever, hoping that they're going to get the jackpot. So after a week to a few months in a narcissistic relationship, I mean, you are putting in way more 
more than you're getting back, but you end up being so emotionally addicted to that person that you might not be able to tell that that's what's happening to you. And even if you are self-aware enough that you can tell that you're getting addicted to somebody, that doesn't mean that you can stop it. That's like saying, I know I'm an alcoholic, but because I know I'm an alcoholic, I can handle drinking this bottle of whiskey. That's, that's not how it works. And the problem with narcissists is that they are also really good at keeping people hooked in. So even if the victim manages to wake up one day and go, man, there's a lot of red flags around here, or man, I've been really unhappy and feeling sick around this guy. That's when the narcissist decides to turn their charm from a zero to a 100. So you might get that little sliver in there where your friend is speaking out and like, I don't like what's going on and this is happening and this feels abusive and I hate this situation. And you're like, okay, well then leave. But as soon as they start getting themselves together to do that, the narcissist is all, oh, baby, honey, sugar, sweetie, I love you. We're going out to dinner. We're going on vacation. I'm going to love bomb you until you can't stand the thought of being without me again. And there might be crocodile tears and all these empty promises of, oh, I'm not going to cheat on you anymore. I'm not going to do this or that anymore. And it's all fake to get the victim back in line because once they do, within a few weeks to a few months, the narcissist is right back to doing what he was doing before. The problem though is that the victim that has spoken out and didn't end up leaving because they got manipulated into staying, now they're ashamed or they're embarrassed or they just don't want to hear the negative commentary from their friends and family anymore. So next time they feel strong, they just stay quiet about it. Narcissists also love to use commitment to trap their victims long term. Like a narcissist can up and discard you, throw you away, go see other people, you know, go marry somebody else. They don't care about you if they decide to leave. But if you try to leave them, oh honey, good luck. If you are in a marriage with a narcissist or you have some kind of major joint property like a house, they are going to fight you tooth and nail and use every piece of emotional blackmail that they can. Like, oh, this was the only home that I ever had or you were the only person I've ever really cared about. That's why I married you. I was so invested in you and now, now you're hurting me. Or they can go the other direction and just get super mean. Like, call you every name under the book so that you don't feel strong enough to leave them. I know my narcissist husband used to call me and HOE every time I was ready to leave him and how nobody would ever want me and look at me I've got three kids by two different dads Ooh, I'm so gross I'm so used up blah 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 like all these horrible things that never leave the back of your head so if you are in any way committed to a narcissist where you just can't up and leave and never speak to them again they are going to use every trick and tactic and piece of blackmail in the dirty book manual to keep you locked in with them. Kids are another area where a lot of victims get trapped into staying forever. Because when a narcissist has a child, they don't see that as an individual person. They say, this is an extension of me. This is my perfect mini me. This is my trophy and it better act accordingly. And that's why the children of narcissists like myself often end up growing up and becoming very big people pleasers or they're very socially anxious because they know if they mess up, there's gonna be huge consequences. And those consequences are never in public, mind you. You are going to be physically or emotionally abused as soon as all those doors are closed and nobody else can see what's going on. And not all narcissists are physically abusive, but almost all of them have trouble regulating their temper to where they could get physically abusive. So keep that in mind. There are people who are really afraid of somebody who is the biggest, smiliest, cuddliest, sweetest person out in public, but a super demon when nobody can see through the blinds at home. So if you're married to a narcissist and there are children involved, you might feel like there is absolutely no way out because you have seen that narcissist with his mask off, screaming and yelling or maybe even hitting the kids. And you start to think, what's gonna happen if I'm not here to get in the middle of this? Like when he legally gets 50% custody or, or every other week in custody and I'm not here to rein in his temper. Or the narcissist could be a super sweet, you know, perfect doting father, but because the victim legally has to co-parent with this person until the kids are 18, the narcissist will use that as a way to keep controlling and contacting and trying to mess up everything in your life. They will be hateful and nasty and evil in ways that you can only know if you have been married to that person. So a lot of victims of narcissists end up staying, not just to protect their children, 
children, but because they're also taught, well, at least if I'm married, I get some good times to go with the bad times. If I get divorced, then I just have all bad times with this person terrorizing me. Another issue that victims often face is learned helplessness. And I've had this for years. I didn't even realize that I had it until I started reading about it and hearing other people talk about it and going, oh my gosh, that's exactly what these narcissists have done to me. So learned helplessness is sort of where you're told over and over and over that you can't do something that you could just so that you don't do it, so that you become more dependent on somebody else. So a lot of narcissists like to convince their significant others not to work. Like, oh, I want you home with the kids or, oh, you have depression and anxiety, so I want to take care of you. I don't want to make you have to go out and work. I want to be the good guy and, and take care of whatever your needs are. But then in turn, that flip switches and then they get this you owe me mentality. But if you're in a narcissistic relationship and you are not working, then the narcissist is going to control you financially. They might control you with your health insurance, you name it. And part of the learned helplessness is also ticking away at your self-esteem until you, as a grown adult think that you can't even take care of yourself if you had to. They'll say things like, well, it's been so long since you worked. Who do you think would hire you? What skills do you have? How much money do you think you could make on your own? I mean, my husband spent 15 years convincing me that I did not know how to cook. And if I tried to cook, that I would somehow magically pass out over the stove. So I heard this for over a decade until I just stopped trying to cook altogether. Or if I did manage to cook something, ew, I didn't do it good. It didn't taste right. It, it was bad. So after hearing this over and over and over again, that I can't cook, I can't cook, I can't cook, here's all these reasons why, I believed it and stopped using the stove. And the funny thing is, I used to cook for myself all the time before I met him. But it was something that my husband could do to control what I thought I could do, to make me more helpless, to make me more dependent on him. Also, a lot of times the victim has not told you this, but their hopes of escape have already been crushed. Now, I caught my husband of 15 years cheating on me, and he ended up admitting to having been cheating on me for six years with hundreds of different people. So we got into this point where we were yelling at each other, and I'm telling him, I don't want to do this anymore. Get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. I told him five different times to get out of the house, and he went, no, you're just being dramatic. And the very next day, do you know what my husband had overnighted to our house? a lock picking set. And a few more days after that, he bought a massive shotgun and assault rifle behind my back, knowing I had very strong feelings about not wanting any guns in the house. And then a few days after that, he bought a handgun too. So he never had to say a word, but it was being very much rubbed in my face that I'm not getting away from him without his permission. Because, oh, you're gonna tell me to get out? No, I'm not getting out. You think you're gonna like kick me out later? Fine, here's a lock picking set. What you gonna do? I'll get back in when I want. Or fine, you think you're gonna make me get out? Here's my shotgun. That kind of intimidation goes on constantly with a narcissist and it can be very hard to prove or to even talk about because it is emotionally taxing. It is straining. It is something that just kills your soul. And at the same time, if you look at that narcissist and call them out on what they're doing, they'll insist that you're crazy. They will gaslight you and say, no, that's not why I bought that. I don't know why you're saying that. Why do you think I'd ever hurt you? Why do you think I'd ever force my way into the house? Because you just had a lock picking kit delivered the day after I tell you to get out. So being with a narcissist is kind of like being assimilated into the Borg. Resistance is futile. It's also good to keep in mind that the victim of a narcissist may have tried and failed to leave before. Because a narcissist will crank up that charm dial, they will cry, they will beg, they will harass, they will stalk, they'll give you crazy gifts, try to take you on these gigantic elaborate vacations, and they will do just about anything to manipulate their victim back into their control. And unfortunately, it tends to be a lot easier to see somebody harassing and stalking you and going, ooh, no, I don't want anything to do with that, than it is to see somebody who is showering you with gifts and kindness and say, yeah, get out. No, you don't deserve a second chance. It can be very hard for people to turn cold during a bout of kindness. So if you know a victim that has tried to leave and then failed, please don't hold that against them because it's just all crazy, crazy, crazy swirling around them and they are already scared and desperate and not knowing what to do. So getting upset and frustrated with them for going back is just going to isolate them in the future. Another thing that I know I really, really, really struggled with is coming to grips with the idea that I'm really 
definitely not as special to the narcissist as he made me believe. Like, even to this moment, I am still in denial about the narcissist I cut off contact with a week ago with, you know, maybe I was actually special to him, even though I know other people he's run the same game on and, you know, pretty much said the same things to word for word. But maybe I am special. Maybe I was the one. Maybe I should have stayed. Because when the narcissist comes into their victim's life, they work very, very hard to convince you, oh, you're so special. I love you. You're perfect. You're the only one for me. You're all I ever want. And familiarity breeds positivity. So the more that this guy is telling you that, the more you're being gaslit into believing that it's true, even if it means nothing to him. It could all be copy pasted words that he is sending to you and then 40 other people right after you. So when that notion is challenged, even when you're presented with evidence, people can go into denial about it, especially if the narcissist narcissist is still in their life and still telling them, no, it's only you, baby. You're the only one I love. I should have been with you all along years ago. So you, the victim, end up in this sort of internal struggle going, no, no, he's told me this a thousand times. Why would he lie? Baby, because he's an emotional vampire using you for food. And that's why a lot of people are in these relationships and willing to jump through so many hoops and give so much of themselves up and maybe even start blaming themselves because that love light starts to dim. In the victim's head, they're going, wait, he just saw me as perfect and now I'm not, so I must have done something wrong. And I will tell you, even recognizing this and saying this right now, if my narcissist showed back up in my messenger today, yes, I would still talk to him. And I may not be willing to speak to him romantically, like, oh, I love you. Yes, let's go back to this plan of living together and having children and all this. But I would still want to know more like, was this real for you? Was I somebody you actually cared about? And try to get that closure out of the situation, even though I know he will never give it to me because that's another key tactic that a narcissist uses. They will cut you off cold turkey and deny you all closure. So that way the door is always kind of cracked open. You know, you always have this emotional hang up that, hey, this relationship doesn't feel finished or, hey, I don't understand why this or that happened. And even if there is no good reason for it, even if it was just, oh, I spun the dial and landed on breaking up with you today, a narcissist never wants you to have closure because closure means you're done and they're never done playing with you. To a narcissist, people are just tools, like a tissue to blow his nose. And I know I keep saying he, 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 he when I refer to narcissists. That's based on my romantic history, but certainly women can be narcissists too. But to the narcissist, people are nothing more than tissues to blow their nose with. And to the victims, the narcissist is like a snake and it just slowly coils around you and it takes everything you have and crushes the air out of you but you're hypnotized and don't realize that you're being eaten alive. I mean, you can take this video and show it to your friend in a toxic relationship and they might agree with every single point that I'm trying to make, but they still won't feel able to break free of that relationship. You cannot force somebody to be ready for that. It takes so much financial and emotional uncoupling to really get out of a serious toxic relationship that it's just so much more than, honey, he's treating you bad, leave. But please, 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 to any friends and family members that are watching this who have somebody in this situation, do not turn your back on the victim. Do not get frustrated with them. Do not get mad when they come to talk to you. Do not say, well, if you don't leave them, I'm not going to watch you hurt yourself. Don't do any of that. Don't leave any ultimatums because narcissists are master manipulators and they will talk your victim into choosing them. Narcissists love to isolate people. They love it because then there's nobody to challenge them. There's nobody that might take their supply away from them. And so they can feed on that person and do whatever they want and spin whatever lies they want. And it's a lot harder to break away. It takes an average of seven times to leave a narcissist before the victim is actually able to cut that narcissist out and be done and not rebound back to them. So just know if you are trying to help somebody, you're trying to save them, you hate seeing what they're going through. It's not that your cries are falling on deaf ears. It's that it is very, very, very difficult to break free of this kind of a situation. So be patient, be there. Even if you feel like you are banging your head against the wall and they are not listening, they are. And they are building strength from what you're telling them, even if it takes them years to actually apply it.
I hope that's been helpful for anybody who needed to hear it. I have a lifelong history with narcissistic abuse, so if there are any topics that anybody is curious about, I'd be happy to kind of give my two cents on it. Again, I'm not a medical professional in any stretch of the imagination, but I have a narcissist mother. I was married to a narcissist for 15 years, still am married to him. I don't think I'm going to get rid of him very easily. Um, he's just nestled in like a tick. And then I have dated a narcissist that has destroyed my brain, basically. My brain, my focus, my ability to be in the moment and not obsessed with him. Very, 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 very good covert narcissist or evil covert narcissist, I guess I should say. But thank you guys for watching. Please remember to subscribe, uh, leave comments with suggestions for other things that you might want to hear about. And remember, the most important piece of advice I can give you is to always put yourself first because a narcissist is always going to put themselves first.